when it comes to Christian art, mm -hmm. I see a pattern where we're trying to play catch up to the, what the world is doing versus us spearheading and leading the charge as mm -hmm. innovators in Christ to basically set the standard, to be the standard. I see a lot of, I'm the Christian version of, or you know, taking flows from the world or studying, and I'm guilty of this, studying the techniques and strategies that the world has when it comes to art and creating and trying to blend their ways and follow their ways alongside following Christ. And it's like, when I do that, I'm felt, I leave very conflicted and confused and I'm doing things on my own strength and I don't have like, assurance of what I'm making, it's just a whole spiral. Mm -hmm. And I'm <clears throat> noticing that, not just in the church, but in myself as well. And it's like, why do you, why do you think that we as Christian artists tend to be more inspired by the world and want to follow what they're doing versus being more inspired by our Father? I feel like on the surface that it's a pretty obvious answer as to why we're inclined that way is oftentimes that's where we come from. Our first nature is the world, mm. right? Like a lot of us, at least I grew up in church, but you know, naturally I did too. as human beings, we are fallen in our character, which makes it easier to go that direction. However, in the sense of art, a lot of our, I guess, those who inspire us are, is going to be the world. And the world, there's some things that are baseline, you know, like, there's a fundamental, like, you can say that Leonardo da Vinci was fundamentally, whether he was a believer or not, I don't know, it was a long time ago, but, you know, more recently, like, how to be a good rapper. Eminem, good rapper. That's how to rap. But when you deconstruct the message and you deconstruct the, like, style is one thing, but... And talent is and another. Talent. And it's like, mm -hmm. that's still, in a way, like, you're exercising the image of God. Mm -hmm. But it's, like you said, the content, the message. Mm -hmm. That's what's but tainted. what we talked about earlier was marketing. Mm -hmm. And I feel like when it comes to how these certain images are marketed... And you're not just dealing with one person at that point. You're dealing with teams of people who are collaborating, like collaborating on how to, how to deliver and, and prop up this image and prop up this style and prop up this person, right? So they take traits of people and expand on it. And that's what influences others. That's mm -hmm. what causes them to be copied and them to be popular over basically inspirational towards people like us is it's not just that one individual anymore it's the entire what the entire team has invented you know and that's where we need to have teams that invent because mm -hmm. they don't just do it by themselves they, they can't know. do it by themselves they have their videographer Even their editors they know art is a collaborative work and it is it requires a lot of people it requires money it requires uh time and thinking think tanks you know a lot of people come Writing together rooms. yep all that I mean when you look at how many writers are on some songs there's like 15 and how many writers are well both film is different but or films even more TV know? series though there's yeah. writing rooms oh yeah there's met numerous people writing TV shows and you know maybe there's a lack of that in the, in the Christian space like collective circles collective circles I agree I think that there There's is a lot of autonomous Christianity and autonomous creation. Mm -hmm. I'm guilty of that too. Me too. Everything that like, I'm pointing out, I'm guilty oh, of. Oh, for sure. At some yeah, point. yeah. But I mean, I feel like that that has been in, created or that has taken root because you know I don't think I think a lot of like Christian artistry is in a sense like it can be puffed up right like mm -hmm. people are caring about what they like it's either this people 
are prideful about what they create or people are trying to protect what they create out of fear of their own brothers and sisters, out of fear of what the church is because there are times people have been hurt, church hurt, or you don't know if they're a real Christian or not or whatever. And that keeps people divided from the collaboration where you don't, I mean, honestly, the only people who get that much, you know, collaborative work is people on labels. Mm -hmm. But as far as, you know, individuals and how they create, you know, they don't have much to pour into them. They don't have much to sharpen them. Why do you feel like, why do you feel like Christians tend to play, like, catch up Mm -hmm. with, like, the world's trends, the world's styles, and mm-hmm. what's happening in the creative <clears throat> world, whether it's in the music mm-hmm. world or the film world or just the art world in general. Well, what? now, now, everything that has preceded us has taken root to such a depth that is propped up to be a lot bigger, right? Like the, the advertisement campaigns, the marketing, the, the, the image has been branded and has been stapled. And so I feel like us playing catch up is it's been already mass produced and mass accepted. Mm -hmm. So the masses have already adhered to this. So they're already inspired. Right. So for for me to go out of my way and somehow. I mean, naturally, humans are competitive. Mm -hmm. Right. Like whether we like it or not, church or not, competition for some reason is just as ingrained into the human experience. In every way, we compete with each other. And so competing to be the highlight of people's attention. And, you know, obviously the word says, like, not by might or not by force, but by God's spirit does he draw people to himself. Like, we don't have to compete to win souls. We don't have to compete for people's attention. But competing against the world shouldn't be our only soul direction and I feel like the more that people compete against the world the more that you're playing catch up the more that you're trying so hard to stand out and be bigger or be better or be just as the world then you're you're always looking at them as com- competition and that's not that's not what Christ is called to do he's called no. us to be light of the world yes yeah, the salt light of the, of the world the salt he's of called the us earth. to be not competitors the peace, of the, the peacemakers world. of it mm-hmm yeah. Because then you're always feeling like they have the upper hand because this is Satan's kingdom, right, mm-hmm. as people will put it. But he's already a loser. But if you have the mentality that you're the victim of the world and the world is always overpowering you, then you're always playing catch up. Then you're always being one step behind. Oh, they did that. I can use that same beat. I can use that same storyline. I can rewrite it to be for God where it's like. You have your own team, you have your own style, you have your own method that's God's method, that's greater than that, that you haven't even tapped into yet because Mm. you're still in the wake of what has came before you, you know? And I feel like to really think outside of that, you have to, You have to see from the perspective of, of God and really understand what the parables and what the word means and what to be separated from the world looks like and to be present with God feels like and is like. I think what I think what we've lost is the art of presence and the art of the secret place and mm-hmm. the art of really coming to God with intimacy every single day and just enjoying him, not coming to him for like, because I'm guilty of this, like, Lord, like, give me ideas, give me... Like, that's cool, but it's like, I should want him more than I want ideas from him. Right. I should yeah. want him yes. more than I want stories from him. I should mm-hmm. want him, him, him mm-hmm. alone. Mm-hmm. And when I catch myself trying to, like you said, play catch up with the world um, and what they're making and how they're creating things, mm-hmm. it reminds me of uh, Psalm 73, where he says, God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of times Mm -hmm. for us as believers, we fall into the temptation of being envious of how successful artists are in Mm -hmm. the world, Mm -hmm. and we compare it to how struggling we can be, or how like 
purposeless it can be or how like minuscule our art can be mm -hmm. which is a disgrace to the lord because we have the spirit of the living god the mm. eternal creator but i feel like we treat the bible sometimes as like not just like they are the bible is a boundary but i was learning today at church like if you just come to the to the scripture as a form of like a boundary but you're not coming to it as a story then you're coming to god in a wrong way yeah and i feel like a yeah. lot of us we've taken the word as like a boundary for mm -hmm. our art and now we feel constrained oh i can't do this oh i can't do that there are mm -hmm. things we can't do like sure. verbatim 100 percent mm -hmm. but we have to have optimism to know that if we're free in Christ, and Christ has died for us to be free, we have even more freedom to to create and to make more than the world does. Oh yeah. Because they're the ones that are in chains when it comes to mm -hmm. creating stuff. They're the mm -hmm. ones that are in bondage. They're mm -hmm. the ones that are in prison when it comes I mean, to like what they create. They're the ones they dying before they peak, before they're even they're 19, 20, 21. They're not even, it's like they haven't been the best version of themselves. And they're dying and they're, without they're hope. Gone. They're dying without joy. They're dying without assurance. Mm -hmm. And the whole world's looking to them like they got the answer, idolizing them. But it's, they're just as lost as mm -hmm. the person that's listening to them, leading them into destruction. And so, but I say Psalm 73 because he talks about the, he's, he's, like, he's like envious of the arrogant. And I look at this as like Christian art, artists when we are tempted to look at the world and how they're creating, we're envious of them because they're being successful, they're prospering, for they have no pangs until death, their bodies are fat and sleek, they're the ones that are successfully living off their art. Even in the church, they're the ones that are profiting off the backs of, of, of Christians because they know it's a good target audience, but they themselves are just ravenous wolves. Mm -hmm. They are not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes swell out through fatness. Their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens, and their tongues <clears throat> stretch through the earth. And, and then the psalmist, he says, all in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. If we apply this to like our scenario, the artist context is like, all in vain have I like, made this pure art for you, God. All, all in vain have I, like, you know, <laughs> done all these things and it's going nowhere. It's, 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 but we're, we're failing to see that um, our art is of eternal value if we're focused on that, if we're only focused on what the world is focused on, monetary value, mm -hmm. um, success, making a living off of it. If that's all we're focused on, like, we're not, we're, blocking ourselves from seeing the full potential that God has for our mm -hmm. art. And then he says, For all the day long I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. If I had said, I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I discerned their end. So it's not until we cultivate presence mm -hmm. with the Lord, where we mm -hmm. cultivate intimacy with the Father, where we're not coming to Him for ideas, where we're coming to Him for Him, mm -hmm. and we're just spending time with Him, we're loving Him, we're receiving His love, we're repenting of our sins, we're in that secret place with Him, we're able to, He's able to give us like a bird's eye view of like yes. what He's doing in yeah. us and what yeah. He wants to do through us, and it says, you set them in slippery places, you make them fall or ruin. They are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors. Like a dream when one awakes, Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast towards you. Nevertheless, I'm continually with you. So he goes on saying, like he compares, saying I was so carnal, comparing myself to the world until I became intimate with my father, mm -hmm. until I became intimate mm -hmm. with God, and I was able to see their art and their intentions exactly for what it is. Exactly for mm -hmm. what it is. Yes. And when you see the world's art for what it is, it's bittersweet because obviously talent is talent, right? You mm -hmm. can't say that they're not talented if 
they have the talent, but their reference point, their inspiration, what they speak of, the emotions that they have, their fuel is of the world, Darkness. which is potent, which is, which tickles the ears of those who believe the same that they do, you know, like talking about murder and guns and drugs and women and parties and that, like, people who love that love it because they relate to it or they... They speak the world's language. Exactly. Yeah. And so the art of the church is trying to speak the world's language with the word. <sighs> Enlightened dark comics. And how do you do that and be okay with it, you know, or like... Mm -hmm. How does that really work? Like, does it, can it work? Is that, is that acceptable? And what language, because how are you trying to present the word, right? You don't want to dilute God's grandness, God's holiness for a few people to understand a glimpse or a watered down version. You have to let the spirit invite people without stooping to their ultimate style and desire. Which is why, you know, you creating your own path from the spirit, you know? God, I mean, the human ear likes a certain tone, likes a certain frequency, likes a certain beat. Like, you know, every human likes that mm -hmm. at a fundament. But when you're blatantly trying to take what another human has done and copy it verbatim, then, you know, it's like, and, I... And, and have the decency to be like, this is for God and I'm the Christian version of it, is like, why do you want to be the Christian version of anything in the right. world? Right. It, don't, it doesn't make sense to me. No. It's appeal, you know, you appeal to people. Do you think it's, do you think when people say that, because I see it a lot, especially in the Christian music space, mm -hmm. it's like, I'm the, I'm the Christian version of fill in the blank. Do you think that's like, they really don't know who they are in Christ? Not or, yet, not yet. Or they, or they're just, there's that's the idol of the world's from the heart, or both. I, I mean, because for myself, right, like, I used to be referred as a Christian version of X Y Z, right? Mm -hmm. And 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 uh, at first it sounds cool because you're just like, dang, like I'm com comparable to them, right? But at the end of the day, like you're always in the shadow of them, mm -hmm. you know, and it's just like. In the shadow of the world, into the shadow of the yeah. Father is crazy. So, when you learn who you are in Christ, and like I felt like I've learned who I am as an artist, it's like nah, this is I have the keys bro, to everything. Mm -hmm. So like eternal access. That that's a different feeling. Creator. It's a different feeling. It's a way more complex, deep, intimate, infinite capacity where your mind just gets unlocked and the music personally to me just comes mm -hmm. and the arrangement just comes the sounds just come and when God provides every other method of bringing it into the fruition it's like music no one's ever heard before mm -hmm. inspired by God himself and like I said like it's like being able to come out of culture come out of this earth, come out of this realm, be with the presence of God, take what's in the realm of God and show it to this time and this yeah, that's, place. Yeah, that's crazy when you put it into words like that. Like, it's, it's a perspective that I think we need to learn how to step into, is how did, how did Jesus somehow, some way, give glimpses of heaven to the world? Stories. Because, because, because... The kingdom of God is, he always says, is like. Is like. Is like this. Kind of like this. It isn't this, but it's like this. Because it's so vast and infinite, you can't put it into all of the words. So what does kingdomly music sound like? Well, it's kind of like this. And it's just the most beautiful symphony and, and orchestrated and music it, you've ever but heard. But it's like it. It isn't it. Exactly. Does, it still doesn't compare. It doesn't compare. But it's the best of our, I guess ability hmm. and I don't think people are thinking like that I think you know you're made for a time and a place such as this that's true but we're also made to be in the eternal presence of God hmm. where there is no time and the place is he is everywhere or at least time to him is eternal 
So what does eternal music sound like? What does eternal music sound like? Well, none of us are going to know. No, 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 no. But but I'll show you what it sounds like. But you could take like. pieces. What it sounds like, right, is one, love. Because mm. without love, you have nothing. So how you have made it is from a place of love, for the love of God. Agape love is from the fundamental. From a place of loving God, mm -hmm. overflowing mm -hmm. love of God. And, and that's at the fundament, you know, like we're man, we're human, we go through human experiences. So like we can't let, we can vent our emotions, but you can't let the emotions take place in your heart of the love of God. Mm. Like if I put my anger as my fundament and my fuel, then my music sounds like anger. No. That's a root of bitterness. No, but you can vent your anger. From a place of love of God. And surrender your anger, yes. Mm -hmm. You can do that. And so... One is from a place of love, and then two is from a place of humility, you know, knowing that what you're creating, how you're creating is fully for God, letting it not become an idol to you, mm -hmm. understanding that every fundament of what you own is grace of God, that by God's grace do I even have this XLR cable, microphone, engineer, software, everything that I am having down to the atom is the grace of God that I'm even here to make it, you know? Mm. Knowing that and then having love for that and then having the joy from that. You know, all the fruits of the Spirit become personified. And then your music and what you create and the mind space that you're in is the kingdom. And you're there and you're like, okay. And then whatever you create is pure. It becomes pure. You're humble. You have the love of God. You have the joy of the Lord, which is your strength. You have the presence of God who teaches you everything. And what <clears throat> you make of that, he shares with you immediately. Mm -hmm. He shares with you the method. He shares with you the type of engineering, the soundscaping, the sound design. He shows you because you're humble. You can be taught. You can let the Spirit lead you. You can have those around you. When you're humble, you can have the collaborative working between people because it's not your way. You have the love to, to be in the studio for 12 hours or however long it takes to make it what it needs to be. When you're joyful, you never get tired of it. Mm. When, when you're able to submit your emotions, you can vent them in a healthy way. You know, you can get what needs to be heard to other people, and the redemption of Christ can work through your story. And you can be vulnerable mm -hmm. in your anger, in your mm -hmm. sorrowful and angry and depressed mm -hmm. moments and seasons. Because you come to him like a child. That's the key, is, is being able to still display anger. Like the Psalms, there's anger, mm -hmm. but it's still coming from a place of like, it's still healing to me. It's mm -hmm. not tempting me to be angry. Mm -hmm. It's pointing me to the one that can subside that anger, that this can is, heal that anger. Come to me all, you know, all those who carry heavy burdens and I will give you rest. A heavy burden isn't just pain and sorrow. It's anger, it's grief, it's... It's everything. It's a heavy burden. Any heavy burden that you have, you can come to him and he will give you rest. And he asks for your ashes. You put your ashes in a song. That's a worship song. That's a sacrifice for you to give. That is your all that you have. Obviously, you know, you don't want to cuss and mm -hmm. be like the world, but it's a vulnerability that that what the world does, you're vulnerable but even better. Because what the world does vulnerable-wise is to be angry, just to be angry, and then still be angry. It, there's no healing. There's no, there's a cycle of death that sometimes that's all that people know. Mm. But God shows you through your testimony of your life that there is redemption. Oh, yeah. And we forgot to mention, Ooh. you are a father now. Oh, no, we did mention that. Almost fell. Hold up. No father now. She's squirming, bro. But yes. Father now. Father this is, now. This is my prized possession right here. The heir to my throne. I thought the son is the heir to the throne. Okay, yeah, technically. <laughs> but if he's no good, she is. If she's no good. <laughs> <laughs> now nah, he'll be good. To get from where you were at to this is like, bruh, that's only God. How did that happen? Like, you went from throwing yourself off cliffs to this. 
Just pulling up with kids. A healthy, sober father who Holy knows fuck. the Lord. Mm. Yeah. I'm gonna play with the mic though. Like, oh, oh yeah. Oh yeah, like, I gotta oh. keep you. Yeah. I gotta keep you at bay here. Alright. So yeah, uh, well the testimony. How yeah, how did this happen, man? How did you how did you go from where you were at to this beautiful site? Well where I was at, I was living in Las Vegas. <clears throat> this was in 2019. I was still a rapper of the world. I was still a rapper of the world. You were a rapper of the world. You were a rapper of the world. I was a rapper of the world. Just for the world. And I lived in Vegas to be closer to LA so I could network and blow up. You know, I wanted to blow Vegas up. Vegas is closer to LA than Arnold? It's like, Vegas is only like two hours from LA. Oh, yeah, my, geog my geography quick. is way off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, I got in contact. I'll condense it as much as I can. I got in contact with this talent ag agency called Chaos Club, where... What a name. Uh, Danny Wolf was in charge of that. And I was like, Florida Danny Wolf? Or? Florida Danny Wolf. Like, wow. Danny... I forgot about him. Uh, Danny, I see you. Like, Danny Wolf, Danny Wolf. Like, wow. So... <clears throat> I um I remember going on FaceTime with one of his talent managers and I started talking to him and their A and R Rio, their A and R Jackson, their cover artist other Jackson who made the covers for Sofago, like had all their numbers and stuff. And just talking about how they wanted to, you know, grow my talent. Hmm. And Bless you. you know, they were in Atlanta talking about getting me out there eventually, but I thought that this was it, bro. I thought like, dang, they're picking me up and willing to manage me and work on an album with me. And Danny was sending me beats, all kind of stuff. <clears throat> and um, I knew that like, like I always grew up in church. So I knew that what I was doing was wrong mm -hmm. in the end, you know, doing drugs and. But you had no power to do right. You pretty like... much, yeah. Mm -hmm. I just felt like I felt like I wanted to be a sheep in wolf skin. I wanted to invade the industry playing their game. I wanted, I, you like, wanted I always, to be I, a sheep in wolf skin. Yes. So like, I was always, I always had my Christian roots, but my own like philosophy of it, mm. you know? So like, I got this tattoo that says Jesus. I got it when I was like 18. The one on your neck? Yeah. Yahweh? Yeah. Yeshua. Oh, Yeshua mm -hmm. in Hebrew. I got this when I was still in the world. Fire tattoo though. And, um, yeah, I wanted to invade the industry and proclaim Jesus later, but playing their game, doing their drugs, and, you know, thinking that would work. So, eventually I was like, you know what, before I blow up or become any person of influence, I got to get right, you know, because I got to inspire kids in a healthy way. And I told him, I was like, I'm going to get clean and sober. And so I did that, and I flushed all my weed down the toilet. I got rid of everything, and this was January of 2021. No, 2020. January 2020. And I... Was it 20? It was four years ago. No, three years ago. Three years ago. So it's 2021. Okay, yeah, it was January 2021. So... I started detoxing and I started having really weird like visions and in those visions it was stuff about like how I was talking to God and he was showing me my old self and how I was Lucifer as a human and how I was misunderstood and Satan was actually a good guy and all this crazy stuff and my identity was slowly getting like open eye visions oh like like dreams. in my like almost like dreams like daydreaming kind of gotcha, but like gotcha. that would just take over and like play in my head I would just sit there and like meditate or whatever mm -hmm. and um you know like I had good intentions but just I felt like I was being taught by Satan and um mm. eventually a few days pass and 
I wasn't really sleeping. I wasn't really eating. It was hard for me to, because you know, I used to smoke weed like a lot, a lot. And uh, I ran out in the middle of the desert one day after not really like knowing what I was doing. I wasn't, I didn't have any intentions. It was just, I was on the phone with my dad. He was talking about how I have to um, take a leap of faith and turn my words into action pretty much, right? So I go walking out from the suburbs. I walk outside on the sidewalk talking to my dad and I look out in the desert and I feel like God is calling me there for whatever reason. You know, I'm just I'm just acting on impulse. And I walk out there. Yes. <laughs> and what else? Do you do you know, the, know the story? Do you know the rest of the story? She was there, bro. Mm-hmm. She was there. So, she's I, like, "This is my favorite story." This is my favorite story. So, I go out there and I start running. <laughs> she's getting scared. She's like, no, she too close to the fire. You think? Is she a little red? A little bit. A little red. Mama, you want to come rescue her? It's a little warm here. She's so like, she's literally the definition of a Gerber baby. She's perfect. She smiled when I said that. <laughs> she's just perfect. So, anyways, um, I go out in the middle of the desert and I start crawling up this hill, right? And as I'm running out there, like, I'm I'm like looking at the sun because in my mind I feel like I'm Satan, who is you know the being the angel of light. And the sun is my home because the sun creates light and the sun is the lake of fire where I'm supposed to be sent to. And in light is photons. And I thought that humans were manifestations of photons, just all that. So, oh yeah, way out there. So I'm staring at... This is without drugs. Without drugs. I'm like a week and a half sober. This is sober. This is sober. A week and a half, no drugs, nothing. The devil is a lie. So... I feel like the sun is calling me home. And also like the son of God, you know, Jesus, crazy. Just all kind of pouring, mixing philosophies. Mm -hmm. And I get to the top of this this cliff and I get naked. I take off all my clothes. And in my head, I guess, I feel like I'm going to transcend the beast, right? I feel like the, the flesh is the beast. And I get naked. And I crouch, and I crouch down, and like I pee, because I feel like this pee was me like a sacrifice of my my water, like I was becoming pure. I don't know. Sounds like some doom stuff. (laughs) And I look off the edge of this cliff, butt naked, and I'm like, this voice in my head says, "If you have faith, jump." And at first, I was like, "No, I can't do that. That's just." That's just crazy, you know? But it just kept on, like, telling me, telling me. And I look at my phone, and my dad's trying to call me. And I feel like that's just the physical world trying to hold me back. So I took a few steps back, and I dove off the cliff. And I landed head first, right on top of my head, here. And when I hit the ground, like, I wasn't, I wasn't concussed. I didn't have a concussion. I didn't black out. The world was spinning. I definitely was, like, woozy. And I rolled over on my back, and when I laid on my back, I grabbed a rock, and I tried to pierce my side. And I, I, like, I don't know why I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm just acting on impulse, just stewing. And it didn't pierce, so I put it over my heart, and I stabbed my right wrist into a cactus. And I'm essentially trying to like recreate the crucifix position. I don't know. And I said, I choose love, I choose love, I choose love, over and over and over. And my whole body was just like burning. Like I was just like having burning sensation. Burning like? Like hot. Internally? Everywhere. Internally, externally. Like my body just felt like sh- in shock or it was just hot. It was cut up. I mean, I was cut up from head to toe. I still got scars like everywhere. Because wow. it was just rocks. It was like there was no water. It was just the desert in Las Vegas, and there was this cliff, and I jumped off it. And I laid there, the head, my blood was just running down my head, and I get up, and I put on my pants. 
And I feel like, like I successfully completed what I had to do. It was like, I thought I was a, a supernatural being at that point. And I called, I FaceTimed my friend and I'm like, bro, I just jumped off this cliff. He's, and he starts breaking down. He's like, bro, what's, what are you doing? Are you good? Like, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, no, nah, it's fine, bro. Like, you'll, you'll understand. And I like hang up and there's like blood coming down my face, blood coming out my nose. Like I'm just tore up all up. You should see my back is just like covered in scratches. Just look like I got like lynched seriously. And I had no shirt on and I walked all the way home. No one stopped to, to like there was cars passing by me. No one stopped, no one cared. And when I get home, um, my neighbor across the street saw me and I didn't want to tell him I jumped off a cliff cause I'm not fully like gone. And I told him that I tried to crawl up into the second story of my house cause I got locked out. And the other neighbor gave me a ride to the hospital. And they said, you know, they asked me like, what's my name? Who's the president? You know, like, are you okay? And when I stood there, like I answered everything right but I almost passed out. Like I, my legs kind of like shuttled, shuddered a little bit. So they put me in a wheelchair and they put me back for a CAT scan. And they said that I fractured seven vertebrae. So they had to, Sheesh. they had to transfer me to the other hospital. But seven vertebral fractures and two compression fractures. Sheesh. So I lost, I think like 25% height in one vertebrae and like 10% or 15% in the other vertebrae. And I fractured a rib. Sheesh. And they asked me if I wanted painkillers. And I was like, no, because I felt like I was supposed to suffer like, like Christ. So I was just like, nope. So in the ambulance ride during the transport, I'm sitting there telling the girl like, I'm an angel, I'm a fallen angel. And I'm like trying to like tell her this crazy like philosophy. She's like, yeah, uh-huh, yep, <laughs> sure. <laughs> and so I was like, yeah, I'm a fallen angel. And you know, everyone's, like I had this weird fascination with like numbers and like gematria and like weird stuff. You were like Sam Litwicky and Transformers too. Trip glitch, yeah, bro. So they take me to the second hospital where they gurney me in, and I'm in like the like I think it was like the resuscitation area, and I was put on the put on the like there was other people who were injured like this girl was crying about I think she was in a car accident because I heard her like screaming and crying she was like I looked over and she was dead and then the cops come in and start talking to her. So I feel like she was like in a drunk driving accident, something. There's a kid here, they have the, the, the things closed. And there's a boy in front of me, he broke his arm. There's people here, someone around the corner is screaming and crying because they're dying or crying, I don't know. And I'm sitting there like, I'm about to heal everybody in this room, right? What you thought? So I get up once and then the doctors are like, you need to lay down, you broke your back, like sit down. And they walked out of the room, so I got up anyway. And I went over to the boy and I told the mom, I'm like, can I pray for your son? And I, and he broke his arm and I grabbed his arm and I'm like, in the name of Jesus, you're healed. You know, and like, he wasn't healed. <laughs> He's still crying. He started crying louder. And I was like, uh, okay. So I go back and I sit down and I'm kind of sitting there like, that didn't work. Why? Something's wrong. And then it hits me. I'm like, bruh, I jumped off a cliff. I'm now in this resuscitation area and I didn't heal the kid. Something is not right, you know? And that's when I got like really spooked. Like I got scared, like in my soul. I was like, bro, like this is, this is like a demonic attack. So before that you were like fully convinced like, in your mind yes, that yes. like you completed what you had to do. You sacrificed your pee and your blood. Like you, you were fully convinced that yeah. this is your reality. Yeah. Like I was convinced wow. that I was a I was Satan in the wow. human form. Wow. Wow. And like I was also the son of God. Like it was just so many Wow, okay, wow. It was wow. just weird, bro. Wow. Weird weird stuff. Wow. And so, um I call my mom and my dad and they're in California and they are immediately on the way. It's like an eight, nine hour drive. So my sister picks me up later in the evening, they gave me a back brace and I went home. And I fell asleep and they woke up, my parents were there to pack my stuff. And for the next like four months, right, when they take me back home to their church, I'm recovering spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically. And it was very difficult. I 
went on Snapchat for a lot of this time. I remember going on Snapchat and on my story I told everybody that I am Lucifer. After? No, this was like this was before. This was like probably like the day before. Sheesh. Like I'm like I am Lucifer and I was like telling people all kind of crazy stuff. I lost all my friends, bro. I had no friends. Everybody thought I was crazy. I was a nutcase. I had no friends. They were unadding me, blocking me. Nobody. And I was very depressed because I had nobody. Everyone thought I was crazy. I thought I was crazy. Some days I woke up. I thought I was a reincarnated Adam. I thought I was the second coming of Elijah. I thought I was the second coming of Moses. I thought I was Jesus. I thought I was an alien or I was being taken over by aliens. I thought COVID was a was a was a nanobots taking over your brain, bro. I thought like this was during COVID. So like I'm just every and this is every day. This is a day to day to day something new, new weird philosophy, new weird something for like this months. Like torment. Yeah. Yes, yes. My mom and my, my dad could clarify and verify that I was losing my mind. Like, there was one time <clears throat> where I remember we were watching a movie or something, and I had these intense, like, visions, mm-hmm. like, in my mind, of, of everybody who got the COVID vaccine was going was gonna to throw themselves in the fire. People were going to set their houses on fire and then jump in fire. And, bro, I start freaking out, and I'm telling my parents, I'm like, we have to run, we have to go, like, like they're going to kill us. And, like, I just start crying and bawling. And, um, yeah, just a lot of weird, like, intense visions, daydreams that would just hit me and I would be tripping. It was a second time where I thought that I was like a weird like government experiment where the shot they gave me in the hospital was going to turn me into a fish boy. <laughs> right? I'm There's no you, way you believe that. Bro, and I was going to try to breathe underwater. I'm serious. <laughs> I am dead serious, bro. I was going to try to breathe underwater. Shark boy looking at <laughs> Bro, um, there was another time where I thought that there was, I thought that the Garden of Eden was in the center of the moon because the moon's hollow or something. I thought that the moon was hollow. In the middle of the moon was the children of Eden and that they actually have advanced science and technology and Jesus was there. And I thought that I was a... Uh, uh, my consciousness was taken over by one of these children of Eden, and I had to make it to the dark side of the moon. Okay, you didn't read anything. Bro, I stuff. read no books. I read nothing. This I had no phone. Purely... I smashed my phone with a rock because I thought that the government was tracking me. Yeah. This is purely... All of my own. Your own imaginations plus the devils. Crazy. Every day was something new. Like, I have, I have journals of just, like, every single day for, like, months. And I saw the psychiatrist, you know, and they were like, he has schizo. This was after the first visit. I visited once, and they said that I had schizoaffective disorder. And then I told the psychologist himself, he was like, well, you were heavily using marijuana and other drugs, so we're going to detox you for three months, and I'll reassess you, right? In the meantime, they gave me a therapist before they gave me medication. Mm-hmm. So I had the therapist, I saw him for like two weeks, and then the psychologist wanted to see me again because he said that he has none of my doctor's notes, none of my notes, right? So I go back in there two weeks later, I tell him the exact same story, and he's just like, oh, no, you're schizo, uh, you need these pills. And I'm like, bro, I saw you like two weeks ago. You told me that we're going to detox for three months. He's like, nope, I think you need drugs now. And so I was like, no, bro. So I left, and... From there, like, it only started getting better the more that my mom and my dad and I would really, like, get into the word. Like, my mom had to ground me every day. Like, you're Isaac Gibbs. This was your birthday. This is where you live. This is who you are. Every day, like, she was showing me and teaching me, reading me the word. Like, slowly but surely, I started having, like, more beautiful imaginations and more beautiful visions and being shown... Um, who God is, who Christ is, how the spirit works in such a tangible way. Like, you know, not just the psychological pain, but my back was still broken. Like, I was still bedridden, sleeping. I didn't even have a room. I slept on the couch with a broken back. (laughs) It sucked. So I slept on the couch, 
And I was scared of music. I never wanted to touch a microphone again. Never. I deleted everything. I blocked everyone I ever talked to. And I never wanted to touch it again. But slowly he was like, no, I made music for you to make for me. And the first time I set up my recording stuff, I got spooked in the middle of recording. I'm like, no, 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 this is evil. And I like shut everything off and like unplug it. And I was scared. But he was just like, no, like keep going. We all make mistakes, you know. And I just kept going, kept going. And it got stronger. The spirit got stronger. I knew the word more. I started getting logic and reason back and being able to decipher reality from fantasy and um, delivered from that insanity pure insanity that now if I'm to put it in a scientific term probably like some kind of substance induced psychosis from detoxing but it's crazy that was three years ago and then since then I got married and I have a child and I'm joining the Navy in two days. How the Navy is taking me, I don't know. God himself. I told him everything. They gave me all that I needed to give them. I gave them medical clearance notes, psychological clearance notes, and I'm good. Every time I hear your testimony, there's always some new aspect to it. I'm just like, bro. I remember a lot, man. I remember, it wasn't that long ago. I don't think your testimony will ever get old. <laughs> like, like mark my words, we're going to make a film about this, Lord willing, like one day. Like, that's it's absolutely insane. And I remember everything to show. And I remember one time you told me it, and it was very profound. You rejected the drugs, and you said... No, the word's gonna heal me. Yeah, the the when they said that um, they wanted to give me, it was risperidol, antipsychotic medication. I was like, no, the, the word is gonna heal me. The Bible's gonna heal me, because I knew that it was spiritual. That's crazy faith. I knew that it was spiritual. I knew everything I was going through was spiritual, and my therapist, I would basically give him Bible studies, bro. Like, at first, they were kind of loony. I was still having my <laughs> my crazy... Like, I was obsessed with, like, unlimited power and, like, energy and, like, quantum physics and... Still are. A little bit. <laughs> but now it's back down to earth a little bit. And when I started telling him about Jesus and music and stuff, like, I was straight up giving that boy Bible lessons, bro. Like, Bible study with my therapist. <laughs> I wonder if he received it or it's just like, oh, this guy's loony again. I don't know, man. I kind of want to call him. I kind of want to call all of my, my psychologists and be like, hey, bro, you know what my psychologist told me? He's just like, mark my words, you're going to be back in this chair. I said, no, I won't. You should call him and be like, yo, I'm going to the Navy. Nah, I want him to see me interview with, with I don't know, Saturday Night Live. Or Saturday Night Live? <laughs> no, I'm playing. <laughs> I'm playing. No, but, yeah, man. It gets, honestly, I kind of forget that that happened to me sometimes. I feel like it's traumatic for a 19-year-old kid. So where you're at now, like, who is Jesus to you? My father, my friend, my brother, all three. I remember having that conversation. I'm like, are you my father? Yes. You my friend? Yes. My brother? Yeah. All three. You fathered your salvation. He's our elder brother. He's the son that made you a son. Mm -hmm. He's everything that we need him to be. Man, and like, the way that the dreams that I was having, because dreams were a very, very big part of a lot, dude. They were so intense. They were so vivid, bro. Some of the dreams were like... Felt more real than real life. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like, like I, I saw him. You know, I felt like I've seen him and talked to him in my dreams. Because sometimes I remember I would be dreaming with him and I would be smiling when I woke up, but I don't remember what we were talking about. Mm -hmm. But we were talking and, like, I would wake up happy, but, like, I was just like... Mm. And I remember, I remember... I know, so, like, that era of my life when I was making music especially, too... My parents made me like a little room on the side of the church. And that was like 
the place where like I was in the middle of like space bro like it was like that little room was just in the kingdom of God mm. bro like time went away from wake to sleep I didn't have to work I broke my back I had like four months six, five months off and I just recorded every day I was on TikTok sharing my testimony reading the word that's how I met you just absolutely poured and surrounded by all he was and who he is. And I feel like, honestly, I've always been trying to get back to that mm. 24-7 submersion. I feel that. I've always, I always reminisce about, like, when Jesus first met me. Well, yeah. I, when I first met Jesus and had the encounter and everything was so fresh and new, like the first love, like the, it was. It was every day, yeah, man, because it, it was during the snow. I remember it would be snowing and cold outside, and I would start dancing, and I'd have flags and music playing. It would heat me up. Do you think it's possible for us to get back? Because I pray to, like, get back to that place. Do you think it's possible, or is it more of, like, no, you're matured now, so there's a lot more responsibility. There's more requirement. There's, it's not just your feelings anymore. It's you going through the trials and the darkness, but knowing that I'm still here with you. It's... It's still there. That's how I feel like it is for me a lot of times. Nah, bro, because the essence of it was being a child. Mm. You got to always be a child when you come to him, and it all floods back, all of it, every time. Because as much as you think you might know, as powerful as you think you might be, you're still just a boy to him. Yeah. You always will be. You know, you'll be a man, and, and, but when you get there, you know, your, your job is done. You're just resting in paradise as a, as a boy, as a as a child of God forever. So I get filled up when I revert back to a child every time, every time. And whenever I feel something's off or, you know, nothing can separate you from the love of God and the way that he's like, hmm. oh, nothing can separate you from the love of God. And that's, how I like really knew that he loved me, will always love me, no matter what. So as being creative, like staying childlike is the key. I think Curious, so. childlike. Like. Needy. <laughs> like, like if you remember being a little boy at all, be that little boy. Be that little boy. Mm -hmm. Be that little boy. Just be that kid to God. I love you, man. I love you too, bro.